So for the past couple of weeks, as I said, we've been, in, we've been covering the land allotments. Um, time has, has now come for Joshua, Eleazar, the elders, the leaders of, of the tribes to now start distributing the land according to, to their lots. And we've seen so far their inheritance east of the Jordan, the, you know, half of the tribe of Manasseh, the, the Reubenites. We also covered uh, Israel's inheritance in Canaan, Caleb's inheritance, Judah's inheritance. And so we're going to continue on with the land allotments in these two chapters we're going to be covering. And I just want to remind you, they're not long chapters like the chapter we covered uh, last week. Um, last week was how many verses? 64 verses, 63 verses. Uh, chapter 16 is only going to be 10 verses, and chapter 17 is going to be 13. So these are really short uh, chapters, and um, so we should be able to get we should be able to get through them. But but these are also important chapters. I wanted to cover both of them because they they kind of go together. Um, and again, I'll explain in, in, in just a minute. But in these two chapters that we're going to be covering, 16 and 17 this morning, we're we'll reading about the next two tribes to receive their territorial allotment. In chapter 16, we're going to look at Ephraim's distribution, or the land that he was distributed. And in chapter 17, it's going to tell us about the second half of the tribe of Manasseh and what they received. So there are a few things also we're going to be learning here in these two chapters. And the challenge again is, is to try to put it, these lessons all together and try to show you again what you, know, what you can learn, what we can learn as a church, what you can learn as, as a believer, um, um, and what the Lord wants to show you through these two chapters. So let's, let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to us this morning. Can you actually turn that off? Or I'm going to be burning up here underneath this, this uh, heater. If you get cold, I'll give you my, my coat. <laughs> but I get, I get really hot underneath this um, heater. I should have, Robin, we should have a blanket here somewhere, somewhere just in case. All right, so let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you again for this morning, and thank you for everyone that's here that is sitting in these chairs. I pray you will bless them and speak to them powerfully as we cover uh, these two chapters, Lord, Joshua chapter 16 and 17. Um, again, these, these chapters may, may seem kind of boring and, and not much there, but... Your word is powerful. Your word is amazing. Your word is active and alive. And we know that even, even if it's one word, one sentence, one name, Lord, that you have a message for everybody. We also pray for those that are watching this message live or maybe listening to it or watching it later on. I pray you also speak to them and Changed lives, the lives that need to be changed, Lord. That, that more people will come and seek you. That they will see their need for a Savior. That they will look upon the cross of Jesus and be saved. Lord, we ask you to fill this room now with your Spirit. All of us will just sit at your feet and listen to what you have to say now through your word. We want to hear from you. We need to hear from you, especially during these difficult times that we're living in. Keep us safe, Lord. Let us not be distracted by anything outside these walls. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. 
Joshua chapter 16, verse 1. The Word of God says, The allotment for the descendants of Joseph went from Jordan at Jericho to the waters of Jericho on the east, to the wilderness ascending from Jericho into the hill country of Bethel. From Bethel, it went to Luz and proceeded to the border of the Arch- Archites by Atheroth. It then descended westward to the border of the Jephthahites as far as the border of Lower Betharon, then to Gezer, Gezer and ending, ended at the Mediterranean Sea. So Ephraim and Manasseh, the sons of Joseph, received their inheritance. Verse 5, this was the ter- territory of the descendants of Ephraim, Ephraim by their clans. The border of their inheritance went, went from Atroth, Adar, on the east to, the, to upper Beth Haran on the north. In the north, the border went westward from Michmethath. It turned eastward from Tanath, Shiloh, and passed east of Genoa. From Genoa, it descended to Adaroth and Nera, and then reached Jericho and went, and went to the Jordan. From Tapua, the border went westward along the brook of Cana and ended at the Mediterranean Sea. This was the inheritance of the tribe of the descendants of Ephraim by their clans, together with the cities set apart for the descendants of Ephraim within the inheritance of the descendants of Manasseh, all these cities with their settlements. However, they did not drive out the Canaanites who lived in Gezer. So the Canaanites still live in Ephraim today, but they are forced laborers. Chapter 16 begins by informing us about the allotment for the descendants of Joseph, which four, verse 4 tells us were Ephraim and Manasseh. Now, if you haven't guessed it already, the Josephites are basically the sons of Joseph. Again, Ephraim and Manasseh. That's who I'm speaking about here. Now, just in case there's any confusion about who these two tribes were, if you don't know the story, let me give you a brief backstory on these two tribes. I won't get too much into it. There's a lot in Genesis, I believe 48, 49. Um, on these two tribes, but let me try to give you again a brief backstory. Unlike the other tribes, Manasseh and Ephraim were not, were not the sons of Jacob. Rather, they were the older and younger sons of Joseph, the eleventh son of Jacob. Of the twelve sons of Jacob, Joseph was Jacob's favorite. I'm sure you know the story of how Joseph, uh, Jacob received this colorful coat and how his brothers became jealous and how it turned into this crazy story and of Jacob being sold into slavery and again, how just everything turned out for good. It's a beautiful story. At times when I read it, it, it does bring a tear at the end, it brings a tear to me when I read just the, the love that happened. You could see at the end there. But, but yeah, this Joseph was Jacob's favorite. Well, both Manasseh and Ephraim, because of Jacob's time in Egypt, they were born there. They were born in Egypt. And because of the high governmental position of Joseph at the time, they were basically royalty there in Egypt. They were like VIP. They were sons of the prince, essentially. 
Everybody knew them. They were of high importance. Again, VIPs there in Egypt. In Genesis chapter 46, we learn that old man Jacob and his 11 other sons and his, his other 11 sons and their families eventually made their home in Egypt too because of a famine. But one day, as Genesis 48 says, Joseph went to see his ill father, his very sick father, Jacob, before he died. And when he did that, he brought his two sons to Jacob. He brought his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, with him. Joseph positioned his two sons before the dying Jacob. So Jacob could place his right hand on Manasseh, the elder, and his left hand on Ephraim, the younger. However, Jacob pulled a fast one. He crossed his hands so that his right hand was placed on Ephraim, the younger, and the left on Manasseh, the elder. Now this act, what he did was contrary to family order and tradition. See, the order was that the right-hand son, usually the oldest son, would get more of the father's inheritance. And traditionally, the younger son would receive a lesser portion of the estate. And so when Jacob crossed his hands, it meant that Ephraim now, the, the younger, would get Manasseh's share of the inheritance. And Manasseh, the elder, the elder son, would receive the younger's son's share. And what did Joseph do? He protested and he told his father, no, not, not that way, my, my father. This one here is the firstborn. The aged and dying Jacob, he refused to switch hands back to the traditional order. He simply responded to Joseph by saying, I know, my son. I know. See, in all reality, Jacob was speaking. He was acting out of divine revelation. He set aside those human traditions and what was supposed to happen, the order of things, and he listened to God. And God led him to do that, to switch those two hands for a reason and purpose. And maybe Jacob didn't really know and understand fully. And no one else did. But later on down the line, we find out that there was a reason and purpose. And this is something that this, this is what this shows us is that this shows us that we have to be really careful when it comes to man-made traditions and, and keeping up with them. Now, traditions are good. There's nothing wrong with them. I mean, we have cultural traditions. We have, you know, family traditions. Uh, many of you, well, you know that we're approaching the holiday season, and, and many of you probably have Thanksgiving traditions and Christmas traditions. And, and again, that's okay. But we must never allow those traditions to supersede what God has, is calling us to do, what he's to listen to, what the Lord is, is telling us to do. We must always follow what the Lord says, and, and it should always be in alignment with what the Word of God says. I mean, he's not going to tell you, hey, you know what, uh, God just told me to go out and murder just a bunch of people. No, that's, you know, the Lord wouldn't call you to do that. He wouldn't tell you to do that. Um, you know, it, it should always align with what the Word of God has already said. But list, my point being is listen. Listen to what the Lord is telling you. And you may not understand it at the moment. You may not get it. But He's telling you for a reason. And eventually, 
If he doesn't reveal it to you right away, eventually he will. Even if it doesn't show you right here, right now, at, you know, in this lifetime, it's one of those things that he will reveal to you when you see him face to face. You can tell him, Lord, why did you make me do it? Why did you, why? You know, why did this happen? Why did you allow this to happen? Why did you call me to do this? And, and he will tell you. You know, maybe, you know, I, I sometimes ask those kind of questions as well. You know, and I, you know, I, I ask, uh, you know, Lord, why, why did you have me plant this church? You know, and there's many reasons why, and I do believe he's called me to plant this church, but who knows, maybe I'll be, you know, I'll go up to, when I see him face to face, when I see Jesus face to face, he might tell me, because I needed you to share the word so this one person you don't even know that you've never seen before that is watching or listening will hear the gospel and be saved. And that, my friends, that church is, you know, really, that alone is, 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 is reason, should be a reason, is a reason why I'm up here. But also for many other reasons as well that following my calling, but you should follow your calling as well. I'm not going to go into a, that rabbit trail there, but again, um, Jacob was saying these things at a divine revelation, not from human tradition. And so as a result of what happened here at, in Genesis chapter 48, um, Joseph's two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, were made founders and heads of tribes with their uncles. So what we're told then in verses 1 through 3, the rest of verse 1 all the way to 3, were the general boundaries of Joseph's territory, the Josephite territory, which was in many respects the most beautiful and fertile land in Canaan. It was basically the best land of the entire, the best fertile land of that entire area. Verses 5 through 9 in particular describe the territorial boundaries of Ephraim and included the sites of some of Joseph's or Joshua's battles, as well as Shiloh where the tabernacle would remain for about 300 years. Nevertheless, this chapter, like the previous chapter, chapter 15, also closes on a disappointing note. There, in verse 10, it says, However, they did not drive out the Canaanites who lived in Gezer. So the Canaanites still live in Ephraim today. They are forced laborers, likely motivated by materi a materialistic attitude, probably because they just didn't want to fight anymore. They just wanted to just be at peace with the people that were already living there. But I suspect it's more because of materialistic reasons. Again, this was a very fertile land, and so... I'm sure there was a lot of commerce there, a lot of money to be that was made there. But wanting more. They wanted basically more than what they were given. They chose to put the Canaanites in Gezer under tribute to gain additional wealth. So instead of being content with what God had given them, they essentially coveted. They essentially coveted what wasn't theirs. And as many of you know, as we know by through the Ten Commandments, covetousness is a sin. And for those who may not know what covetousness is, it's wanting something of somebody that doesn't belong to you because it looks good. You want it. And you want to take it. Covetousness. Sin. 
Hayden Robinson offered this definition. Covetousness is wanting more of what you already have enough of. So covetousness can mean wanting more than maybe the wife you've been given. Maybe the house you've been given, the car you've been given. You know, the things that the Lord has given you. It's looking at others and saying, oh, I want that Lamborghini. I don't, I'm not satisfied with my little Toyota that I have. I, I want that Lamborghini too. You know, looking at another man's wife and saying, well, my wife's not good enough. I want her. I want that wife. Again, it's sinful. It's evil. And so because of their disobedience and covetousness, the sin of covetousness of not kicking out the Canaanites from their territory, it did. It proved to be a fatal mistake. You see, in later centuries, in the time of Judges, the arrangement was reversed as the Canaanites rose up and enslaved the Israelites. Now, in addition to the historical lesson, there's also a spiritual principle here. See, it's all too easy for a believer to tolerate and excuse some simple sin only to wake up someday to the grim, to the grim realization that it's risen up to possess and drive him or her to spiritual defeat. So the point being that it pays. It pays to deal with sin decisively and harshly. See that sin there, that temptation there. Deal with it. Deal with it. Don't allow, don't play around with that sin. Don't say, hey, you know what? It's no big deal. It's, it's nothing. And if you have, as, as, as a man, if you have a problem with pornography, hey, you know what? Stay away from those kind of things that are going to rile up those feelings. If you have a problem with gambling or with wasting money that should be going to other places, stay away from those lottery tickets. You know, I mean, uh, you know, stay away from the casinos. Be careful, don't mess around. Don't think that was just a minor little sin. Again, if you're not careful, one day you're going to wake up and you're going to be like, man, this sin has taken over, has taken over my life. It's destroyed my relationships. It's destroyed my income. It's, it's destroyed so many things. And now I'm the slave. Don't be the slave to sin, my friends. Don't be a slave to those sins deal with that sin decisively and harshly. But not only that, it also seems that Ephraim, and we'll also see it with Manasseh later on, seemed to have a spirit of entitlement. Remember, these were the prince's sons. They were the VIPs. They felt like important. They felt entitled. These were... You know, again, the sons of Joseph. So probably, again, they probably had us, the, the entire tribe had a spirit of entitlement, entitlement. We're a great people. We're the sons of Joseph, the savior of both the Egyptians and the Israelites in a day of famine and starvation. Joseph even interpreted the dream for Pharaoh. Regardless of their semi-royal blood, their attitude was just completely wrong. The attitude of entitlement, completely wrong. Again, this leads me to, to tell you, to tell, just to remind, you, remind the church, remind you as a Christian that none of us are entitled. 
We are sons and daughters of inheritance. Inheritance is a grace gift. Inheritance, my friends, my brothers and sisters in Christ, is a grace gift. These tribes were assigned, were assigned a duty, yet they hadn't finished their work. They did not cast the Canaanites out of their territorial plot. There was territory available for them. However, the enemy forces needed to be driven out. Be careful with having that entitlement mentality. Yes, we're saved. Yes, we are sons and daughters of the Most High God. We are choirs with Christ. Just remember who you were before you received Jesus. And everything you've been given isn't because of you, because of your works, because of how good you are, what you've done. No. It's a gift from God because of His grace. That same gift that you've been given can be given to anybody. Anybody can be given to that Jewish Orthodox person living in Israel, and it could be given to that Hamas terrorist. Grace is a gift from God, and anybody can receive it. Anybody. Again, I'll speak more on that in, when I get towards the end, but let's now move on to the, to the, to the next tribe, the tribe of Manasseh, the second half of the tribe. So let's pick up in verse 17. Joshua, chapter 17, verse 1. This was the allotment for the tribe of Manasseh as Joseph's firstborn. Gilead and Bashan were given to Machir, the firstborn of Manasseh, and the father of Gilead, because he was a man of war. So the allotment was for the rest of Manasseh's descendants by their clans. For the sons of Ab Abizer, Abiezer, Helek, Asriel, Shechem, Hefer, and Shemitah. These are the male descendants of Manasseh, son of Joseph, by their clans. Now Zelophehad, son of Hefer, son of Gilead, son of Machir, son of Manasseh, had no sons, only daughters. These are the names of his daughters. Ma Mala, Noah, Hogla, Milka, and Tirzah, they came, they came before the priest Eleazar, Joshua, son of Nun, and the leader, saying, The Lord commanded Moses to give us an inheritance among our male relatives. So they gave them an inheritance among their father's brothers in keeping with the Lord's instruction. As a result, ten tracts fell to Manasseh besides the land of Gilead and Bashan, which are beyond the Jordan, because Manasseh's daughters received an inheritance among his sons. The land of Gilead belonged to the rest of Manasseh's son, sons. The border of Manasseh went from Asher to Michmathath near Shechem. It then went southward towards the inhabitants of in Tapua. The region of Tapua belonged to Manasseh, but Tapua itself on Manasseh, but, but the Pua itself on Manasseh's border belonged to the descendants of Ephraim. From there, the border descended to the brook of Cana, south of the brook, south of the brook cities belonged to Ephraim among Manasseh's cities. Manasseh's border was on the north side of the brook and ended at the Mediterranean Sea. Ephraim's territory was to the south of Manasseh, Manasseh's to the north with the sea as its border. 
They reached Asher on the north and Issachar on the east. Benchin, Iblium, and the inhabitants of Dor with their surrounding villages, the inhabitants of Endor, Tanakh, and Megiddo, the three cities of Nafath with their surrounding villages. The descendants of Manasseh could not possess these cities because of the Canaanites, because the Canaanites were determined to stay in this land. However, when the Israelites grew stronger, they imposed, they imposed forced labor on the Canaanites, but did not drive them out completely. Joseph's descendants said to Joshua, Why did you give us only one tribal allotment as an inheritance? We have many people because the Lord has been blessing us greatly. If you have so many people, Joshua replied to them, go to the forest and clear an area for yourselves there in the land of the Perizzites and the Rephaim, because, because Ephraim's hill country is too small for you. But the descendants of Joseph said, the hill country is not enough for us, and all the Canaanites who inhabit the valley area have iron chariots, both at Beth Sheen with its surrounding villages and in Jezreel and in the Jezreel Valley. So Joshua replied to Joseph's family, that is Ephraim and Manasseh, you have many people and great strength. You will not have just one allotment, because the hill country will be yours also. It is a forest. Clear it and its outlying areas will be yours. You can also drive out the Canaanites even though they have iron chariots and are strong. Well, the time has come for the tribe, the second half of the tribe of Manasseh, the firstborn son of Joseph to receive its territorial inheritance and allotment. Now, what I find interesting here, now I, I won't get into all the details about all the, the, the land you know, villages and, the, the, you know, but let me just share some things that I, I found interesting in, in chapter 17 here. I found interesting was that only twice in this entire book, we, there's a female, a female's voice is heard. In chapter two, Rahab, the prostitute, vocalized her desire for mercy, that her life and those of her family might be spared from the inevitable destruction of Jericho by Israel's God. And last week, in chapter 15, Ahsa, the daughter of the conquering Caleb, requested a field with accompanying springs of water from her father. Well, here now, another female voice is heard. In this chapter, the daughters of Zelophehad, the descendant of Manasseh, represent their father and request their own tribal inheritance. About 45 years previously, during the final and fading moments of Moses' 40-year administration, these same five daughters of Zelophehad approached Moses, Eliezer, the high priest, the representative leadership of the tribes and the congregation of Israel. And there that story is told in, in Numbers 27. They presented their unique case of a father who had not participated in the Korah conspiracy, but eventually died without fathering a son, though he did have five daughters. Now, this was problematic in the matter of the transference of inheritance. You see, a son was required for the passing on of the inheritance and keeping a father's name and legacy alive. But as you see, this wasn't the case here. The issue in Genesis 19 when the daughters, uh, this was also an issue in Genesis 19, when the daughters of Lot, a man who had also no sons, got Lot 
intoxicated and had illicit sexual relationships with him after their mother's death. They sought to become pregnant with the sons of their own father so that the father's name would continue, producing an heir to inherit God's promise to his family had also been the dominating thought in Abraham's mind in Genesis chapter 15 and 16. So this was a big deal. Well, Zelophehad's daughters, they were adamant about making sure that their father's name wouldn't be wiped out, wouldn't be wiped out. It, it would continue to exist even though he didn't have any sons. Now, two things stood out to me here. First, first, these women, or this, this the, 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 the clan here, they had the courage to ask for it. And these, actually, these women, yeah, they had the courage to ask for it. The request had been straightforward and simple. Give us property among our father's brothers. Doing that was unprecedented. There was no record in the archives of Israel's history of anything, anything resembling it. And so like a good spiritual leader, Moses took this case for the Lord. He did not deny the request of the women on the basis of tradition or acquiesce to his community's feelings of patriarchy. Moses agreed with God. The Lord told Moses, Moses, um, Lord told Moses, Zelophehad's daughter's request was right and proper, and they would receive the inheritance that had been given to their uncles their father's brothers. This Old Testament episode anticipates the New Testament word of non-discrimination in the church. The church, the body of Christ. You know that verse. Some of you know this verse. Galatians 3.28 There is no Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female, since you are all one in Christ Jesus. And secondly, these women trusted God to keep his word. Moses died in the wilderness and did not enter the promised land to honor the request of these five daughters personally they had to wait about 45 years because their request could not be processed and executed until the new national leader was chosen to replace Moses. So now, under Joshua's administration, Zelophehad's name would indeed continue with the tribe of Manasseh and his daughters received an inheritance among their father's brothers. Again, they trusted in God to keep his word. The story shows that God deals with people. He deals with each and every one of you on an individual level. He knows you. He knows your request. He knows your heart. He knows what's going on with you. He knows your struggles. He knows your victories. He knows you're going through that desert. When you're going through that storm, he knows when you're feeling that joy of him showering you with his blessings. And yes, again, he deals with you on an individual basis. That's amazing. That's beautiful. This was, again, an amazing start to the distribution of the land to the families of the tribe of Manasseh. However, there must have been a feeling of detachment 
within the tribe of Manasseh, a feeling of incompleteness. The half-tribe of the eastern Manasseh's warriors would soon depart and return to their families, whom they hadn't seen for the seven years that they had been involved in in that military engagement and driving out the Canaanites. Again, you have to remember that first half of the tribe of Manasseh agreed along with Reuben to fight alongside the other, their brothers, the other tribes to take over Canaan. If I'm not mistaken, it is Reuben, right? On the eastern side? I think so. Let me make sure you pull up the map again. I don't want to mistake. I'm sorry, Gad and Reuben. So they agreed, Gad and Reuben, along with the, uh, along with the first half of the tribe of Manasseh, Half the tribe of Manasseh agreed to fight alongside the other tribes to take these territories. And so now that the battles have been won, land has been taken, they knew that, that tribe knew that eventually their brothers, the other half of Manasseh, would have to return back to their families. Thank you, Sam. It would be leaving their western brothers and sisters to reunite with their other relatives on the east side. And so it had to be bittersweet parting for the half-tribes of Manasseh on either side of the Jordan. They may have felt the painful impact experienced by one who has had to say goodbye to a loved one crossing to the other side. Even when the departing one is a believer, the pain is deep and crushing. Those two half tribes of Manasseh would be equal. For they emerged from the lowlands of Joseph, but they would be separate. But here's the thing here's what we learn towards the end of that 12 and 13, verses 12 and 13. Like their brother Ephraim, who could not drive the intractable and obstinate Canaanites, there in verse 10, we see at the, in those verses in 12 and 13, Manasseh had the same disappointing experience of being unable to completely expel the Canaanites. And so these verses, the verses, chapter 15, verse 63, chapter 16, verse 10, and chapter 17, verse 12, they ought to remind us believers of how important it is to dislodge the enemy from our lives. It's not enough to be victorious in most things. Our goal, our goal as believers is to be completely victorious. To not be partially victorious, but to be completely victorious. That's the goal. We're not allowed the luxury of retaining evil in any part of our lives. All habits that don't meet the approval of God, they must go. You must leave. They must, you must have nothing to do with it. You must let it go. All propensities, all tendencies, all those hidden things lurking in the most innermost recesses of our beings that are opposite of God's purpose in our lives, they must go. Brothers and sisters in Christ, you have to let them go. We must trust the blood of Christ to empower us to live holy lives. See, as a believer, God has assigned you 
He has assigned you to defeat Satan and his demons by pressing on in Christ to higher ground through the power of the Holy Spirit. Let me repeat that. God has assigned you to defeat Satan and his demons by pressing on in Christ to higher ground through the power of the Holy Spirit. You must remember, it's important to remember the example of the ancestors and choose God's ways. We don't drive out those evil inclinations. They will pop up and drive us out of the will of God. We will be weakened, weakened by them and our vision will be, dis, will be dimmed by them so we cannot confidently discern or hear clearly what God is saying to us. Let me repeat that but making it more personal to you. If you don't drive out those evil inclinations, they will pop up and drive you out of the will of God. You will be weakened by them and your vision will be dimmed by them so you cannot confidently discern or hear clearly what God is saying to you. Those things are there. Those sins, those tendencies, those inclinations are going to dim what God wants to clearly show you. It's it's going to mute God's voice. If you really want to hear what God wants to say to you, what he wants to share with you, if you want to see those open doors, let those secret sins go. Let, let those things, those desires, those, those things that are hidden, those sins that are hidden deep in your heart, let them go. Allow Christ to take over. Allow the Holy Spirit to have more and more and more of your heart. He wants all of it. He doesn't want a piece of it. He doesn't want half of it. He doesn't want three quarters of it. God wants it all. As his child, he wants all of you. So again, if you want to hear from him clearly, if you want to see more of him and to see his blessings more clearly. Gotta let those sins go, my brothers and sisters. So, what can we learn from these two chapters that we just read? Like many believers today, these, true, these two tribes need to be indicted for grumbling over generosity. They said, how can you just give us one plot since we're a great people? Children of Israel had a history of grumbling. You guys remember at the Red Sea, they grumbled. For a rock, when they wanted water, they grumbled. They also grumbled about the manna, right? That it wasn't appetizing. Oh, we're having manna again. Currently, I see it, I think you see it too, we are raising a generation of children who are ungrateful and who do not want to put in the sacrificial work of acquiring what they want. Entitlement, again, here's that word entitlement, feel like I deserve it, it's mine. Why should I have to work for it? They grab and they grumble. Here's the thing. You can never give a greedy person enough to satisfy them. Is that true? Yes, definitely. You can never give a greedy person enough 
to satisfy them. They're always going to want more. And when they have more, they're going to want more. Our generation, this, our young generation, this generation that we're raising up now, they need to learn to depend on the Lord. Why is that? Back to what I said a minute ago, because God assigned believers to defeat Satan and his demons by pressing on in Christ to higher ground the power of the Holy Spirit. Past experiences, past experience ought to have brought present confidence in the God who had taken the wheels off Pharaoh's chariots and who would enable the Josephites to defeat the giants in their territory though they were equipped with chariots. Brothers and sisters, church, we trust in the God of yesterday, today, and tomorrow, forever. But when we struggle to do so, we must remember God who helps are greater than our hindrances whose invitations are greater than our intrusions, whose opportunities are greater than our oppositions, whose possibilities are greater than our problems. So when you're struggling, let me remind you of that again. Remember God, whose helps are greater than our hindrances, whose invitations are greater than our intrusions, whose opportunities are greater than our oppositions, our oppositions, whose possibilities are greater than our problems. As a believer, as Christians, we must be willing to go to the hill country with confidence in our God. There are, some hill, there are some areas in the hill country of our society that we need to explore as it relates to the church, family, and culture. The hill country of industry, the hill country of enterprise, the neglected of society. Those that other people, other Christians, other don't want to deal with those groups that are vastly different than you, who have a different world view than you. We need to explore it as it relates to the church. You also must beware of making too much of titles. Titles aren't as important as testimonies. The Josephites were proud of their connection to Joseph because of Joseph's reputation. Undoubtedly, this was a great stimulus for their spirit of entitlement. You know how, who else was entitled? Or who had a title? Pilate. Pilate had a title. But John the Baptist had a testimony. For Jesus called, them, called him the greatest. Pharaoh had a title. But Moses had a testimony of being the meekest man in all the earth. Ahab had a title. But Elijah had a testimony for being the prophet of God who could, through the power of God, withhold rain from falling for three and a half years. Herodias had a title. But Mary Magdalene had a testimony for being the first human being to see the resurrected Christ.
Many people have titles. But you, my friends, have a testimony. And that testimony is more powerful than any title. Remember that. Keep that in mind. Share your story. Share what Christ has done in your life. The person who you once were and who you are now because of the blood of Christ. Because of what Christ did on the cross. That testimony will always be more powerful than any title you will ever be given. Even if you were given emperor of the United States, your testimony will always be more powerful than that. Again, the Josephites said they were the great people. Joshua was at first called Moses' assistant. However, at the end of his life, he is called the Lord's servant. There in chapter 24, verse 29. Greatness should not be announced, but rather demonstrated. Friends, you've got to know who you are. You've got to know who you are. Right now, at this very moment, you are great. You know why you're great? Because you're sons and daughter of the Most High God. You must humbly go to the wood country, for there salvation is found. Someone once noted that the wood of a crib and the cross are the same. Jesus went to the wood country, the hill country, from the cradle to the cross. He even wore a crown of thorns, wood. He's called the carpenter's son, a craftsman of wood. Yet the carpenter's son rose with healing in his wings. Jesus Christ, he is our great salvation. He is our Savior. And He will save each and every person that calls out to Him. Is that you this morning? Do you find yourself at a place where you need a Savior? No matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, no matter who you've been with, Christ will forgive you. He will wipe it, all those sins, away and will make you white as snow. And all you have to do is come to the cross and ask Him to forgive you. Acknowledge, recognize who you really are Admit that you're a sinner and ask him to forgive you, and he will. That's why he died. Have you found salvation, my friends? You can be called great. You can be called great today at this very moment. If you're willing to just reach out and accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. And that's what you'd like to do. If you're ready to surrender your life, to be forgiven of your sins, to be called great, to be called a son or daughter of the Most High God, I want to invite you to the cross. So wherever you're at, I I want you to close your eyes and bow your head. And with all your heart, with all sincerity, with all your heart, with all sincerity,
pray this. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I recognize now that I am a sinner. And I ask you right now for your forgiveness. I'm sorry. Sorry for what I've done, things that I've said, the people I've hurt. Forgive me. Right now, at this very moment, I do. I believe that you died for my sins there on the cross. And that three days later, you rose from the dead. Now, at this very moment, repent. I turn from those sins and confess you and you alone as my Lord and Savior. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for forgiving me. I accept that forgiveness. More importantly, thank you for saving me. Believe that you have saved me from sin and death and now that I'll live with you for all of eternity, forgiven. So now I ask you to fill me with the Holy Spirit. Fill my entire heart with the Holy Spirit so that He may help guide me and teach me and show me and my, I, may, I may feel and experience and, and know God more personally. So that I may understand Him more that I will fall in love with him more. So using that Holy Spirit to remove the junk in my life in my, that's in my heart and that it may be completely 100% given over to him. Thank you for what you did on the cross for me. In your name, amen. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope you were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.